Good morning, everybody. Corey used Buddy History. Today we're going to continue with Family Jewels. I figure we'll be on this for a week or two. Um, and then what we'll do is we'll jump back into some Jack Ruby. Because we have a long, obviously we have years to go on Jack Ruby. I'm going to try to intermingle these Jack Ruby files in with everything else that we do for the next fucking couple years, honestly, because we got like 16,000 pages of Jack Ruby files. And I sense that um, much of the knowledge that I don't have in regards to the assassination surrounding Jack Ruby will be found in those files. I believe all the evidence of things that I suspect about Jack Ruby will be found in those files. So will it be worth it to take years to go through them? You're goddamn right. You're goddamn right. And fuck, if not me, who else is going to do it, right? Nobody. So, today we're going to continue on with Family Jewels, moving into some interesting stuff. This is kind of a random scattering. If you haven't noticed, like, the FBI and the CIA like to throw random shit together. And call it a file, um, which is what they've done here for the what is called the family jewels. So most of this, I believe, is CIA record documentation. CIA plus church committee and outside investigative staff and whatnot. But uh, let's continue. Memorandum for the record. Subject, recent activities of the Watergate special prosecution staff. One, early in the evening of 10 December 1973, I received a telephone call from Redacted. Redacted, who informed me uh, that he, in turn, had received a call from Redacted Intelligence Division, Washington Metropolitan Police Department. Two, it seems that Redacted had just spent an hour in conversation at his home with a Redacted in the Washington Metropolitan Police Department, who had reported to him on his interview that afternoon with a Mr. Martin and a Mr. Horowitz, prosecutors of the Watergate Special Prosecution Staff. Redacted had been subpoenaed for his appearance, and he indicated to redacted that the two prosecutors were principally concerned with two matters a what type of training had the agency given members of the washington metropolitan police department how long were the courses and how often were they given and b what support did the agency provide to the washington metropolitan police department during demonstrations occurring in the washington area in late 1969 and early 1970 Three, Redacted said that he had been shown a long list of names and asked if any of them had been involved in either with the training given to the Washington Metropolitan Police Department or support to the Washington Metropolitan Police Department during the demonstrations. Redacted could remember only three names on the list. They were, and those are obviously, Redacted. Four, the three individuals named by Redacted did in fact participate in both the training and support during the demonstrations. They are only three among others of my redacted special support group who were involved in these activities. Of extreme sensitivity is the fact that these same individuals were engaged in other highly sensitive activities, which could cause the agency severe embarrassment if they were surfaced today in the current Watergate climate. Five, I briefed the director personally on this development, and he indicated that if the training and demonstrations surfaced that He would simply acknowledge that this had occurred, but as he had assured members of Congress, we would not engage in this type of activity in the future. He agreed with my suggestion that we have the Legislative Council brief Congressman Nedzi and Senator Stennis on this since they have already been briefed on all activities of this nature undertaken by the agency in the past. I briefed Mr. John Warner, acting general counsel, and agreed with him that we would make no effort to brief members of my redacted until... And if they are subpoenaed, Mr. Warner or members of his staff will then caution them to only answer questions asked and not volunteer additional information. I'm making a copy of this memorandum available to redacted of the inspector general staff at the suggestion of the inspector general, who I also briefed on this development. That's from Howard J. Osborne, director of security, someone who I need to spend a lot more time on. All right. Continuing on, we got a couple cover sheets. Cover sheets I'm not really going to go over unless there's something really specific jumping out. Uh, memorandum for 
Executive Secretary, CIA Management Committee, subject project twofold. <clears throat> One, this memorandum sets forth a recommendation for your approval in paragraph five. Two, for the past several years, this office has been supporting the Bureau of Narcotics and Dangerous Drugs by spotting, assessing, and recruiting personnel to form an internal security unit whose primary mission is the detection of corruption within the BNDD. Subsequent to the recruitment and training stage, the individuals selected are turned over to the Chief Inspector of the BNDD for operational guidance and handling in their various domestic assignments. So the BNDD, the Bureau of Narcotics and Dangerous Drugs, did not last very long. <clears throat> it was created after the Federal Bureau of Narcotics went folded and before the DEA. But see here, you have obviously the CIA involved in the staffing of BNDD. So what does that tell you? The CIA controlled BNDD. Then we know from thanks to Doug Valentine that when the DEA was created, the CIA basically fucking infiltrated and took over the DEA and put people in internal uh, affairs that would be in positions to deflect from the CIA's drug trafficking. I mean, you can't make the shit up. Three, recently this agency has extended this activity to supporting BNDD and the covert acquisition of individuals who are hired as staff agents utilized under a non-official cover and directed against the principal international drug traffickers. These individuals are true employees of the BNDD, and although all administrative details rel relative to their employment are handled within the agency, they are unaware of any agency involvement. For it is felt at this time that a reaffirmation of our support to BNDD and Project Twofold is necessary and desirable. Project Twofold. Let's see if we can't pull any information in, independent on Project Twofold. 2WO-FOLD. Uh, therefore, it is recommended that approval be granted to the continuation of Project Twofold as originally approved by the Director of Central Intelligence on 12th of February 1971. Again, from Howard Osborne, this person who I definitely need to do a deep dive into. Subject project twofold. We have an asterisk per Mr. Colby's recommendation in DCI concurrence, terminate paragraph two activity and continue paragraph three only as the activity pertains to foreign assignments to collect narcotics intelligence abroad. Some more cover sheets here. 11th of May, 1973, Memorandum for the Record, Subject, General Office of Security Survey. Then we have a heading that's redacted. Uh, one, at the Director's instruction and with the concurrence of the DDP, the Office of Security developed informants in RID to report on the activities of RID employees on whom security questions had arisen. This program, which included upwards of a dozen informants at its peak, had declined to its present level of three only one of whom is reporting regularly on matters of current interest. Two, the principal object of security's interest through this informant is a female who has employed in RID for a number of years until she resigned in 1969. <clears throat> her resignation coincided with the initiation of a security review on her by the Office of Security, but security does not know whether the employee was aware of this security review at the time of her resignation. Three, security's interest in this employee was occasioned by reports that she had developed an increasingly intimate acquaintance with a Cuban national. Reporting by one informant who was also being developed by the Cuban suggested that the Cuban might have an intelligence interest in the female. The same informant also subsequently reported that the Cuban had numerous other contacts among clerical and secretarial employees of the agency. The next sentence is redacted. Four, subsequent to her departure from the agency, the ex-RID employee entered into a common law marital relationship with the Cuban and joined him as a partner in a photographic business. In this capacity, she solicited business among CIA employees, especially those requiring passport photos. Recently, she and the Cuban sought to employ securities informant in this business on a part-time basis. Five, information on the background of the Cuban is fairly extensive, but is inconclusive. He's known to have been a member of anti-Castro organizations in this country. There are also reports that his mother was imprisoned in Cuba at one time. There are other episodes in his life that suggest intelligence involvement on his part with some hostile service, but this is not yet definitely established. Six, 
The Office of Security has had at times a second informant in this case. His reporting has tended to confirm the reporting by the principal informant. Number seven is completely redacted and it takes up about a quarter of the page. Eight, the Office of Security has been running this operation for over two years in an effort to obtain conclusive proof of its intelligence nature. CI staff has been kept informed. The FBI, which was informed of the case at an early stage, has declined to take responsibility for it on grounds that it concerns CIA's internal security. As a result, the Office of Security has been inhibited in the actions it can take against the Cuban suspect. On the other hand, security has not taken any action against agency employees for fear of compromising the operation. Nine, it would appear to me that the Office of Security has dallied with this case long enough, apparently unable through positive measures to resolve doubts about the case. The Office of Security has followed the course of watchful waiting, hoping the Cuban would take uh, precipitant action uh, himself that would give us the evidence we seek. In the meantime, our knowledge of the relationship between the Cuban and several other current agency employees with whom he is known to have contact continues. Uh, the next page, we have a very long redaction, most of the page. Somewhere in the middle here, it says, The possibility that the employee in SB division may be passing information on CIA's Soviet operations is too great to warrant further delay in moving against her. Okay, The rest of the page is redacted. So obviously, they think there's something going on with the CIA employee and this Cuban, who appears to be an anti-Castro guy, uh, and something to do with Soviet operations and passing information. So... I have a feeling that all during this time, particularly with KGB, particularly with CIA, probably in customs a lot, I would think, you have a lot of insecurity, a lot of internal suspicion, a lot of wondering if people are spies, a lot of paranoia overall, right? I would say the vast majority of that paranoia was unwarranted. Memorandum to the Inspector General, Subject, Office of Security Survey, Office of Security Support to BNDD. One, in December 1970, Robert Ingersoll, head of the Bureau of Narcotics and Dangerous Drugs, asked Mr. Helms if the agency could give him some assistance in shoring up the internal integrity of the BNDD. According to Ingersoll, the old Federal Bureau of Narcotics had been heavily infiltrated by dishonest and corrupt elements who were believed to have ties with the narcotics smuggling industry. Ingersoll wanted us to help him recruit some thoroughly reliable people who could be used not only as special agents in his various offices around the country, but also to serve as informants on the other BNDD employees in this in these offices. Uh, the next two pages are fully redacted. And that was signed uh, by John Lawrence, obviously from the BNDD. <clears throat> what I'm assuming is in these redactions is... Um, what he's requesting. Basically, he's wanting the CIA to basically take over BNDD on an uh, internal affairs basis is what it seems. Um, Next page is another routing sheet from Howard Osborne, May 9th, 73. Memorandum for Deputy Director of Management and Services, subject press allegations, re-use of agency polygraph. One, this memorandum is for your information only and confirms a report I made to you by telephone earlier today. Two, on 22nd July 1971, an article was carried on American proposals relative to the SALT talks in the New York Times over the byline of William Beecher, B-E-E-C-H-E-R. It was devastatingly accurate and contained direct quotes from a presidential advisory memorandum the White House had sent to Mr. Gerard Smith, Director Arms Control and Disarmament Agency, a few days earlier. The president was alleged to be furious with this unauthorized disclosure of classified information and directed a sweeping investigation within the United States government to determine the source of the disclosure. Investigation was conducted under the direction of Mr. Egel, E-G-I-L, Krogh, K-R-O-G-H, and Mr. David Young, staff assistants to Mr. John Ehrlichman, counsel to the president for domestic affairs. Three, on the basis of investigations conducted by state security and defense officials, four individuals, one individual in the Department of Defense and three individuals in the Arms Control and Disarmament Agency, 
were tabbed as leading suspects. Mr. Eggle Krogh contacted me on 26 July 1971 and requested that we arrange to polygraph the three suspects in the Arms Control and Disarmament Agency and volunteered the information that the Federal Bureau of Investigation would be asked to polygraph the one suspect in the Department of Defense. <clears throat> so, let me just point out here once again that... None of this stuff seems to have anything to do with the family jewels, does it? The family jewels allegedly were the combined, you know, the combined uh, grouping of documents that went on to show that the CIA was engaged in some shady shit and they were doing some shady shit with the mafia, right? Particularly, uh, that brings us to the ZR rifle files, which were pulled into this. And that brings us into, that brings us like uh, all the Jean-Pierre Lafitte stuff and the Otto Scorzani stuff, the QJ Wynn stuff. And so currently what we're talking about is stuff that was going on in the 1970s, years after anything that was alleged in Family Jewels to have occurred, right? The compilation of the Family Jewels stuff really was supposed to focus on the ZR rifle stuff, the mafia stuff, um, anything illegal that was going on that the CIA was doing, of course, none of which was committed to paper. None of the Kennedy stuff was committed to paper. We got the entire JM Wave fucking crew down in Dealey Plaza. None of that's committed to fucking paper. I promise you that. So the CIA is running cover for themselves by putting in a whole bunch of this stuff that's way after the fact that has nothing to do with the family jewels, right? So let me continue. Four, I informed Mr. Krogh that from time to time in matters involving the national security, uh, uh, the agency had detailed to Mr. G. Marvin Gentile, Director of State Security, a polygraph operator and a polygraph machine for his use in polygraphing State Department employees who were recipients of allegations concerning their loyalty. I emphasize that this procedure had the director's approval and that State clearly understood that the examination was their total responsibility. I further informed him that this was the only way we could undertake to entertain his request and that even then it would require the specific approval of the director. Mr. Krogh asked me to obtain such approval and work out such arrangements with Mr. Gentile. Five, later that same day, Mr. Krogh called Mr. Gentile and inquired as to whether the arrangements had been made. Mr. Gentile indicated that they hadn't suggested that same polygraph operator to be used to examine the defense suspect. Mr. Krogh informed Mr. Gentile that he considered this an excellent idea and that would he would instruct defense officials to make their man available to Mr. Gentile for a polygraph examination. Six, the four individuals were redacted, of course. The polygraph examinations resulted in clearing the four men and results of the examinations were forwarded over my signature to Mr. Gentile on 29th of July, 1971. A copy of my covering memorandum is attached. Seven, Mr. Murray Martyr, M-A-R-D-E-R, a staff writer for the Washington Post in an article dated 3 September 1971, stated that a State Department spokesman had acknowledged at a news briefing that agents of the Federal Bureau of Investigation had polygraphed the State Department employees suspected of leaking information on the SALT talks in July. Mr. John Edgar Hoover, then director of Federal Bureau of Investigation denied this allegation in a letter to the Washington Post and said that the polygraph examinations had been conducted by another agency. Speculation centered around the agency, but after a day or so, press speculation in this regard died away. Eight, Mr. Martyr apparently has never been satisfied and has been pressing Mr. Charles Bray, State Department, uh, spokesman for confirmation of agency involvement. Mr. Bray Learned today that Mr. Martyr plans to use a press conference to be held at 2 p.m. this afternoon. To press this point further, Mr. Bray has been given guidance by Mr. Gentile to avoid confirmation, but if this is impossible, he will indicate the examinations were conducted by State Department security officials utilizing an operator and a machine detailed to the department for this purpose. I do not know whether or not the fact that the government-wide investigation was directed by Mr. Eagle Krogh is known to Mr. Martyr, but I suspect that it is and that this is the reason why the matter has been raised again. <clears throat> Mr. David Young was an instrumental was instrumental in pushing my office to conduct an internal agency investigation of this disclosure, and the White House was satisfied that no agency employee was the source. Again from Howard J. Osborne, Director of Security. <clears throat> 
<clears throat> All right. Looks like uh, we have a July 1971 memorandum. Possibly July 9th. <clears throat> Memorandum for Mr. G. Marvin Gentile, Deputy Assistant Secretary for Secretary Department of State. Subject, Special Technical Interviews. One attached to the technical interview reports on redacted. Full paragraph redacted, by the way. As in other cases involving the use of polygraph, it is imperative no reference be made to this agency's involvement in these actions. Three, as you will note, the reports are not classified, and I shall defer to your judgment in regard to the level of classification for the Director of Central Intelligence. And it is, once again, for Mr. Osborne. Memorandum for Inspector General. Subject, items in John Clark Memorandum to the Director of Central Intelligence, dated May 9th, 73. So there's a follow-up to that letter. One, two items in the attached memorandum had not previously been reported. The first, quote, use of CIA funds and facilities to redacted for FBI and provision of technical equipments by NSA redacted for use against a redacted. Two, in a follow-up meeting with Mr. Clark, he advised that involved here was the use of funds uh, appropriated for CIA being given to the FBI in cashier's checks for the purpose of redacted. There was also agency help given in redacted. <laughs> Goddamn. Further, other CIA monies and cashier's checks were given to NSA, who, with some redacted assistance, was working on redacted. Mr. Clark said he thought the only person here was in the use of... The only problem here was in the use of funds, not in the operation. He thought the only source of additional information on this subject was Mr. Redacted of the DDO slash CI staff. Three, the second item... Quote, use of CIA funds to help State Department defer presidential representational expenses of President Lyndon B. Johnson's trip to Southeast Asia. Four, Mr. Clark said the total amount of money requested by the State Department was $3 million, but that the director would not agree to this amount. The director did supply funds in those instances where some operational activity was involved or could be inferred, i.e. redacted. Mr. Clark was not sure of the amount of agency funds used. He felt that only Colonel White could supply additional details. He said Senator Russell and Representative Mahan, M-A-H-O-N, were advised of this agency activity, but asked not to be briefed in detail. That was from the <clears throat> Inspector General. <clears throat> Memorandum for Director of CIA. Subject, per your instructions. One, I have no recollection of specific contacts with the Ellsberg case, Watergate, or Young. Dick Helms' instructions at the time regarding discussion of Hunt's previous employment should be a matter of record. Two, other activities of the agency which could at some point raise public questions should they be exposed and on which Bill Colby is fully conversant are CI activity of Dick Ober, uh, redacted and redacted investments and accumulation of government capital, Use of CIA funds and facilities uh, to acquire U.S. real estate for FBI provision of technical equipment by NSA. Redacted for use against redacted. Use of CIA funds to help State Department defer presidential representational expenses of LBJ trip to SEA. This is from John Clark. All right, moving forward, more cover sheets. May 7th, 73, Director of Finance. One Deputy Director for Management and Services, Redacted Headquarters. <clears throat> Director of Central Intelligence, Redacted Headquarters. I guess that's who it's to. Memorandum for FBI referred to in paragraph one is not shown in other documents in the agency. It has been kept very close with Mr. Yale, Mr. Magnuson, and possibly Mr. Colby. All files have been purged. May 7, 73. Memorandum for Director CIA via Deputy Director for Management and Services. From the Director of Finance. <clears throat> Subject, Special Other Government Agency Activities. A lot of bureaucracy in the CIA, right? Lots. The Deputy Director for Management and Services. What the fuck do you do? 
Colonel White. Colonel White's a name that's popped up a bunch of times in, in my Kennedy research. I don't think I have identified Colonel White. <clears throat> uh, this is all a bunch of redacted stuff. Uh, this is a series of numbers. Uh, one and two are fully redacted with the exception of, it says Colonel White, executive director. So it must be en route to Colonel White. Uh, three, detailees. The agency has reimbursable and non-reimbursable agreements with the White House, Department of Justice, defense agencies, etc., based on signed memoranda between the Director of Personnel and the various agencies. Four, Project Twofold, reimbursement from Bureau of Narcotics and Dangerous Drugs for training of BNDD agents by a domestic agency, security, proprietary. Yeah, let's pull everything on Project Twofold. Thank you much, sir. Uh, five is fully redacted. <clears throat> Six, payment to White House. Reimbursement to White House is approved by Executive Director Comptroller for $33,655.68. Representing cost of postage, stationery, and addressing of replies to letters and telegrams received by the White House as a result of the President's speech in Cambodia in May of 1970. <clears throat> All right, so once again, we have things written here and printed in triplicate, typical CIA, nonsensical fucking document organization. So have you guys heard anything yet pertaining to the family jewels or pertaining to ZR Rifle or QJ Wynn or the mafia? No, not really. <laughs> All right. Another cover sheet, May 24th, 73. At least we're staying chronological. So we should be able to follow along. To headquarters, attached to pertinent documents and papers relating to paragraph 6 of the Director of Finance's memo to the DCI dated 7th September, May 1973. Subject, Special Other Government Agency Activities. Warren D. Magnuson. Mr. Magnuson's phone conversation with Mr. John Brown at approximately 10.20 on 26 May 1970. Brown, guess we're back together again. Magnuson, got more problems? Magnus, uh, Brown, yes, don't know how much Watts told you. Magnuson, I didn't talk to Watts. Uh, I think he called Colonel White. Let me explain, explain the background. As a result of the Cambodia speech, we're getting relatively inundated with correspondence, and normally all of this is sent to the Department of State for answering what we're doing, uh, we're continuing to send all cons uh, correspondence to state. However, the president made determination he'd like to answer support over his signature here. And we asked the Department of State to support us on this effort. They're in a position where they can provide only limited support at this time. They're committed for $10,000, which would probably handle in the area maybe 60,000 responses. Magnuson, how many responses altogether, counting pros and cons? Brown, the cons are quite a large group that they're handling themselves also. Are they going to be handling the pros too? <clears throat> $10,000 is for pros. They're doing cons. On pros, they can pick up only $10,000 worth. We estimate it'll be around $8,000 per 50000 And it looks like at present time, we got over 100,000 responses in and it could get upwards of 150000 or greater. It looks like we'll need a minimum of another 10000 Probably in the area of 15000 additional. This covers cost of printing, postage, and addressing. Magnuson, just printing, posting, and addressing, not any overtime for salaries or anything like that? No, the posting of the things we'll do ourselves by hand, no problem. We're talking about physical cost of job, cost of stamps, cost of envelopes and cards, cost of having them addressed by outside firm. We'll handle putting stamp on, inserting, and sealing, and mailing, only, only uh, talking about costs associated with three aspects of the operation. Postage, addressing, and printing. Yes, the reason I ask uh, NSA uh, to see if they could arrange, depending on how volume goes, probably another ten to $15,000. Magnuson, these are just pros. State is handling all the cons themselves. Brown, yes, this is just a portion of the pros we're talking about. My understanding, get in touch with you to work out mechanics of how we would handle the billing to make sure it's straight and we do it properly so it fits in with your accounting system. This is only a portion of the pros. State's doing some too. They're contributing 10000 to the pros as well and doing all the cons. They're picking up quite a bit of a load as a result of this. One hell of a lot of response coming in on this. 
bound to be. Tell you, John, let me give you a call back later today if I may have to take a look around where I would fit this in stuff in. You going to be in all afternoon? I'll be around. If I'm not in my office, I'll get back to you as soon as I come back. I'll give you a call then. Can't be real uh, definite. Not sure how we're going to speak out. Not sure about what the backlog is. I'll check out that. Uh, so when we talk about this afternoon, I'll be a little more definite. Probably run into that area, I think. Okay, I'll get back in touch with you. Okay, thanks, Warren. That's the end of the conversation. All right, now Mr. Magnuson's phone conversation with Colonel White at 1540 on the 26th of May, 1970. Magnuson, I talked with John Brown today, and it seems like, as you mentioned, as a result of Cambodia, inquiries going into White House. The State Department is doing all the work on the cons. There are pros and cons. The State Department is going to answer all of the cons, and the president has determined that he wants to answer personally all the pros. However, the state has agreed to pick up some of those, too, in the amount of $10,000 that will cover maybe 60,000 of the answers. They estimate there's going to be 100,000 to 150,000 answers that will have to be put out by the White House. Estimate it's going to cost around eight thousand per fifty thousand. Think it's going to might be a hundred and fifty thousand, ten to fifteen thousand additional, which the White House will have to pay for. The charges are only going to be for printing postage and addressing by an outside firm. No salaries for overtime or anything like that. They're going to lick the stamps in the White House, paste the stamps on, and insert the messages into the envelopes. John Brown said he had requested NSC to see if they could arrange, presumably with us. I guess for another 10,000 to 15,000, depending on volume. He was talking as to more or less foregone conclusion. We would uh, get to it. I made no commitment. Told him I'd look into it. How would we do this? We do it by asking them to pay the amount and then send over another 1080 to us uh, with bill for postage, bill for the addressing of the envelopes and bill for the printing and company. And then they would just send a check back. They would send short memorandum with it certifying these are the charges. <clears throat> I think we want to know what uh, we spend our money for, but I don't think we want the public records to show that we paid for it. What we can do, sir, I can ask them to send over a 1080 with certification that these are the charges for classified services per our conversation. And if you're willing to take that, we can certainly do it that way. Huh. So my question here is why the fuck are they going so back and forth about money for responding to criticism of Cambodia? That's what I want to know. I feel like there's some double talk going on here, but I don't know. Ultimately, they make an agreement here about how much money is going to be spent on this fucking stuff. And then we have another conversation with Magnuson and John Brown at approximately 5 o'clock on May 26, 1970. He says, I think we can go ahead and do this. Uh, we have to be careful the way it's documented. That's the only thing. We'd like to suggest that right for the memo, kind of co-signing it, agreeing to the amount and so forth and the way we do this, the memo would have it in it. And what it's for, and then you would send us a 1080 for this, referencing the memo in our conversation. He goes, you're thinking in terms of reimbursing us again. This is Brown. Wouldn't it be better for us to have direct charge to you? No, because a public record, in order to have all the things in our hands, it wouldn't look good for us to pay the bills direct for this sort of thing. It would not? No, if you pay people the bills, um, interrupting even to pay a large postage fee, bulk of expense will be postage. But then we have to document what it's for. If you people can just pay it, then we'll uh, give you money for it. What would our memo say? Uh, say attached as 1080 referencing memo dated such and such. What does the uh, memo say that we're making reference to? I'll write that up and bring it over to you. What, basically that we're going to say it's about what it's about? Have 10,000 with a limit of 15,000 then would be for printing of these things and so on. So yeah, this is a whole bunch of nothing about their printing these responses. For some reason, this is a big deal to them. I don't understand why. It's taking up a bunch of pages. <clears throat> All right. Continuing on, June 8th, 1970. Memorandum for the record, reimbursement to the White House for certain printing, postage, and addressing expenses. One reference is made to the telephone conversation between Mr. John Brown, Staff Secretary White House, and the undersigned concerning the accounting and reimbursement procedure for White House expenditures in connection with the printing, postage, and addressing of replies. Two, it's estimated and agreed that these expenditures would be approximately 10000 but not exceed 15000 
And uh, upon receipt of the above memorandum, standard form 1081 and copies of the vendor's invoices. And that is from Warren Magnuson. All right. They finalized their bills at $16,982. All right, and after skipping about 25 pages of miscellaneous financial uh, documentation, we finally come to something else. All right, so here we go. Memorandum for Deputy Director for Management and Services, Subject Special Report. One, this memorandum is in response to a request to provide information on situations or associations that might appear to be irregular on the surface. Two, details to the White House and government agencies' background. For many years, the CIA has detailed employees to the immediate office of the White House per se and to components associated intimately with the immediate office of the president, such as the Council on International Economic Policy and the president's Foreign Intelligence Advisory Board. We have furnished secretaries, clerical employees, and certain professional employees on a reimbursable and non-reimbursable basis. At the present time, we have no clericals or professionals assigned to the immediate White House, but we do have one young man detailed to their communication section. There are detailees to the PFIAB and CIEP. I might point out that we had detailed to the White House as late as the fall of 1970, couriers, telephone operators, a laborer assigned to the grounds, and a graphics man who designed invitations for state dinners. By October of 1970, more funds were apparently available to run the White House, and most of our detailees were hired as bona fide White House employees. All right, I need you to understand what he just said there. By October of 1970, more funds were apparently available to run the White House, and most of our detailees were hired as bona fide White House employees. The CIA is not the only agency furnishing the White House with a detailee. So the CIA infiltrated the White House in October of by October of 1970. I love when they just admit this stuff. Levies have been made by this administration and others on defense and state and other government entities whose employees have top secret clearances. Professional officers have been and are at the present time assigned to the National Security Council. And we've been se- and we have seven clericals on detail to the National Security Council on a reimbursable basis. In addition to the above, we have technical specialists detailed to NSA, an instructor at the National War College, and security officers detailed to the Department of State to protect foreign visitors. Recently redacted was detailed to the Secretary of the Treasury along with four other agency employees. We have even in rare instances detailed our people to congressional staffs for a short period of time. So what he's saying, he's talking about the financial end of things and getting reimbursement and all that kind of stuff. But what he doesn't realize is he's spilling the beans and letting everybody know that the CIA has their people everywhere in government. Three details to the White House and government agencies. Discussion. Details to the NSC, the White House, NSA, and National War College are probably quite defensible. On the other hand, there may be those who would question agency employees currently working at the Bureau of Narcotics and Dangerous Drugs and Mr. Peter Peterson having an agency employee as his secretary when he was the Secretary of Commerce. (laughs) She also made a trip with him to Moscow. Don't you see how that could be problematic? She is still with him in his present assignment, but we expect that she will report to NSC for a new detail sometime this month. Redacted served for over 10 years as director of the Office of Public Safety for AID. This information has been kept close to the vest. During that entire period of time, he's been approved for disability retirement and is presently on sick leave and will retire automatically at the expiration of this leave. Each detail of an agency employee to the White House or other government agency has been carefully considered and approval at a higher level obtained when professionals were involved. For Project Twofold, I believe the support we're providing to Project Twofold is an activity that should be reported under your guidelines. 
since this is an extremely sensitive project and the Office of Security is reporting on it. I will not repeat the details in my memorandum. Five, individuals engaged in domestic activities. In a more general sense, Contract Personnel Division prepares and executes contracts with individuals engaged by the agency to carry out domestic activities. We also process staff agents who are domestically assigned. None of these assignments are decided in OP. I really have no way of knowing, with any degree of certainty, what the specific duties of these individuals will be. Six, heading and paragraph completely redacted. Seven, much longer heading and paragraph completely redacted. Eight, Hunt requests a lock picker. This is a record of external employment assistance branches action on a request from Howard Hunt for a lock picker who might be retiring or resigning from the agency. Sometime in the spring of 1972, Frank O'Malley of EEAB received a call from Howard Hunt who asked Frank if he had a retiree or resignee who was accomplished at picking locks. Mr. O'Malley sent him a resume on Thomas Amato, A-M-A-T-O, who retired 31 July, 71. Mr. O'Malley did not document his EEAB record to show the date of this exchange, but redacted who also works in EEAB. Opines that it occurred sometime between March and May of 72. All the above information was reported to the Office of Security on 4th of October, 72, following the FBI's contact with the agency regarding Howard Hunt. 9. Resume sent to McCord. Redacted, a contract employee who retired September 1971, was a client of the External Employment Assistance Branch in his search for a job after retirement. One of the leads given to Redacted was James McCord's security business. EEAB sent a resume to McCord, but Redacted was not hired. In midsummer 1972, Redacted telephoned EEAB from Chicago. He had a job there with the Halifax Security Company, a lead provided by EEAB, but until his this telephone call, he had not notified EEAB that he had the job and had moved from the D.C. area. He said he had been visited by a special agent of the FBI who told Redacted that his resume had been found among McCord's papers. The agent wanted to know if Redacted had any connection with McCord. Redacted explained how the resume got to McCord after the agent left him. Redacted telephoned EEAB. Redacted of OP and Redacted of U.S. were notified immediately or OS, it must be Office of Security. And that's from Harry B. Fisher, Director of Personnel. More cover sheets, Director of Logistics, May 14, 73. Memorandum for the Director of CIA through Deputy Director for Management and Services. Subject, Sensitive Activities Performed by the Office of Logistics. One, this is a memorandum containing information from the direct, uh, for the Director of Central Intelligence. Two, this memorandum is submitted pursuant to advice given by the Deputy Director for Management and Services on 7th of May that office directors report on activities, either under their cognizance or otherwise known to them, the nature of which could possibly need explanation or justification when viewed within the statutory responsibility and authority of the Director of Central Intelligence. The responsibilities of the Office of Logistics, OL, are such that in all matters herein reported except to the actions undertaken were at the request of another agency component. We've prepared a brief description of each action involved and then have included the name of the sponsoring component. The substantive reason for the requests for action by this office will have to be determined by inquiry to the design sponsoring component or to the designated sponsoring component. Three, facts pertaining to both actions undertaken at, at the initiative of this officer as follows. And you have two full pages of redactions. And that's it for that for that memo. So, all right, next one. Subject, sensitive activities performed by the Office of Logistics. The DDO, we will not honor any requisition for surveillance equipment unless it has been approved by the CI staff of the DDO. Uh, four, within the area of contractual responsibilities. Oh, so this must be a continuation of those first couple of sections that are redacted. Within the area of contractual responsibilities, the following items are pertinent. A, in February 71, Colonel L.K. White, the then Executive Director Comptroller, called me to attend a meeting in his office, also attended by Mr. William Colby. Colonel White explained that the Technical Services Division had been requested to provide assistance for the FBI for a sensitive project designated and redacted 
currently designated redacted Colonel White did not disclose the purpose of the assistance being provided by the Technical Services Division, but did instruct me to assist TSD on a purely contractual matter. Um, Jim, can we pull everything on Colonel White, please? I think that's all we have for him. Since the Office of Logistics has no information concerning the mission or purpose of the project, redacted, substantive questions concerning the subject should be addressed to TSD. Other procurement actions accomplished for the FBI are reported below. Specific mention is made, however, of redacted because of the dollar magnitude, approximately $1 million, and the complex technical equipment that has been involved in the undertaking. B, the procurement division, OL, currently has two requisitions in hand from TSD, which would involve reimbursable sales to the FBI. One such requisition in the amount of 36900 is for two Westinghouse television cameras. The second requisition in the amount of 11200 is for two wide-angle surveillance probes manufactured by Bausch & Lomb. No action is being taken on either of these requirements pending further instructions, which will be sought from the Deputy Director for Management and Services. See, over the years, this agency has often supported other government agencies from a contractual or material standpoint upon the submission of an officially approved request. Supported by a transfer of funds, the agency would either enter into accommodation procurements for the requesting agency or support the requesting agency by the issuance of material from stock. Such actions are legally accomplished under the Economy Act of 1925. This act authorizes one agency to support the needs of or provide a service for another government agency. When such action would be more economical and eliminate the need for one agency of the government to duplicate facilities readily available from another. A typical example of this is procedure of purchasing photo interpretation gear for the Defense Intelligence Agency, element located at NPIC. In connection with the current reporting requirement, however, I have had our records researched for the past two years, and Attachment 1 reflects those transactions which appear to be relevant to the subject of this memorandum. D, in connection with the disclosures during the summer of 1971 that the RAND Corporation was not properly safeguarding classified documents, this office undertook two acts. I directed the security officer from our West Coast Procurement Office at the Moffett Naval Air Station in California to visit the RAND Corporation and satisfy himself the classified material furnished them by the agency was both properly safeguarded and accounted for. His report was affirmative. On the 23rd of August, 1971, the senior security officer assigned to this office forwarded a letter to the RAND Corporation stressing and reaffirming the procedures RAND must follow in safeguarding classified information furnished them by the agency. Of residual interest in this matter, there is summary uh, summarized the contents of a memorandum of 2nd July 1971 to the Executive Director Comptroller from the DDI, which is in our possession, this memorandum reports that FBIS regularly disseminated reports to the RAND Corporation, but that instructions had been issued to cease distribution of classified reports. While no other direct dissemination went to RAND, other USIB agencies, primarily USAF, were passing many copies of DDI products to RAND as authorized under USIB regulations. The memorandum also states that RAND personnel had requested searches and document retrieval from the CRS facility. Five, in connection with action taken for the Office of Security, there are three relevant items. A, Printing Services Division, OL, was requested by the Office of Security to print a book written by Harry J. Murphy, Office of Security. The book was prepared by Mr. Murphy under a Brookings Institution Federal Executive Fellowship. The book's entitled, Where's What? Sources of Information for Federal Investigators. It is a full treatise on the existence of sources of information that may be useful to an investigator. The book's first printing of 300 copies was made in June of 1967. Due to demand, a second printing of 600 copies was made in September 68. The title page of the book gives attribution to Mr. Murphy, Office of Security, Central Intelligence Agency, and the Brookings Institution Federal Executive Fellowship. The book is classified confidential, and it is our understanding that the distribution was made to appropriate agencies of the federal government. A copy of Mr. Murphy's book can be made available for review if desired. Sometime in 1972, a representative of the Law Enforcement Assistance Administration, LEAA, requested that the agency give it consideration to our publishing at LEAA expense an unclassified version of this volume. It was the intent of LEAA to make broad-scale distribution to police departments throughout the country. 
the director of security and I consulted on this matter and jointly determined that the LEAA request should not be honored because the agency should not put itself in the position of publishing law enforcement material for general and unclassified purposes, and it would be an abuse of our printing facilities. B, on the 5th of January, 71, the director of security requested that I approve his leasing up to 11 motor vehicles for use in connection with a special support operation, which would last approximately three months. The director of security informed me in his requesting memorandum of 5 January 71 that this support activity has been undertaken at the specific instruction of the director and has his personal approval. The request was approved. C. From 1968 to date, the Office of Security has requisitioned from this office a considerable amount of material, which we understand to be given or loaned by them to local police departments. In certain cases, some of this material was issued from agency stocks, and in other cases, direct procurement of the material was made by funds furnished by the Office of Security. A complete listing of such material is found in Attachment 2. Next page, completely redacted. And then it comes to Section B. This office is aware, although it had no cognizance nor responsibility, that an apartment was rented in Miami Beach, Florida during the period of the Democratic National Convention, July 10th to 14th, 72, and the Republican Convention, August 21st to 24th, 72. The apartment was used as a meeting place, redacted, in liaison with members of the Secret Service and rendering assistance in connection with the political conventions that were being held. Western Hemisphere Division is the cognizant operating component on this matter. The above recitation of facts represents, to the best of my knowledge and memory, those matters which appear to be relevant to the subject tasking given by the director. That's from John Blake, the director of logistics. And then, of course, we have another couple redacted pages and then a slew of what look like Requisition documents, more requisition documents, more redactions, all right, and so I think this is what we're going to call it for today, and um, I will find some good stuff in here for tomorrow where we will continue. So thanks for tuning in, everybody. Um, if you're interested in my bloodyhistory.substack, I'm running a promotion right now. If you buy the annual promotion for 50 bucks and get the entire year, it's, it's almost 100 episodes in there already covering everything, all the great topics, you know, from Hitler and the Nazis to uh, the gas chambers and all that stuff. Uh, if you do that and you spend the 50 bucks, I'll send you a free copy of my book signed. So I think it's the deal of the century. So if you're interested in that, go to bloodyhistory.substack.com and sign up for 50 bucks, and then I will reach out to you and I will get your address. So that's going to do it for me today, guys. I'll be back tomorrow. And uh, till then, thank you.